Welcome to the series on complex analysis and in today's video I'm going to be introducing you to the concept of a complex number. So you may have come across this before, especially if you have studied calculus in the past. But one thing about complex numbers that people need to know is that they arise essentially from the need to actually find the roots of an equation that actually doesn't cross the x-axis. And this was quite a fundamental problem in mathematics many, many centuries ago. And people realized that, in essence, if you want to find the roots of that particular function or equation where it crosses the x-axis, you need to resort to some sort of new definition of what numbers are. So everyone is familiar with what the real numbers are. So if I draw you the set of real numbers, we know that this is basically every single number from minus infinity to plus infinity and it includes rational numbers so it includes things like um, 4 over 3 it includes numbers such as e which is the Euler number numbers like pi which in fact are irrational or actually not irrational and irrational number is something like square root of 2 uh, the numbers the Euler number and pi are called transcendental numbers because they cannot be defined by any of the other terms that we have used so far and basically what we can um, infer from those numbers is that we're pretty pretty um, comfortable working with them because they, they usually give us the answers we need to find. But what about this equation, you may ask? There's, an, there's a parabola that, cro that crosses the y-axis at the point y equals to 1, and always that lo that's located at the point x equals to 0. So our question might be, what at what point does it actually cross the x-axis? Well, from the graph you can tell it never actually crossed the x-axis. But what happens when you write this equation? Let's have this equal to zero. So let's suppose that we didn't know how to graph this thing and we were interested in finding the roots of this equation. What would we write? Well, the only thing that we can do to this is have the following. And then if we want to find um, the actual value of those roots of those values of x, we would have the following. But common mathematics will tell us that this is not possible, that this is undefined, because there is essentially not a single number in the real numbers that you can multiply by itself and it will give you a minus 1, because remember, remember if you multiply a negative number by a positive number, it gives you a negative number. And if you multiply two positives or two negatives, you get a positive number. But you need this to be the exact same number. You cannot have a number squared where it is squared by multiplying by a different sign because this is not the same number as that. So this is not something that we can have in our definition. So in order to fix this, there's a concept called the, the imaginary numbers that was invented. And basically, the way you can visualize this is as, imagine that you now have another axis that is coming out of the plane, out of the xy plane. And now, let's suppose that, um, just for the sake of argument, we're going to say this, pl this new axis is not the set axis, because if you have seen three-dimensional um, graphs before, you will know that the set axis is the one that is perpendicular to both x and y and it is the third dimension, but in essence the new imaginary axis is not a third dimension but rather a dimension that exists, a, another plane that coexists wi with the real numbers but on a different level. It, it's sort of a hard thing to visualize, but if we were to plot this particular number then what we would do is, well, how can we have this? How can we possibly have this here? Well, the, o the only logical solution to this problem is to have another axis and we'll call the imaginary axis and then this function is now going to become some sort of surface and it is going to be very very um, strange in its shape because it's now going to look like it is sagging towards that point and that point is essentially that point at which you have minus one in here so, so even though technically on the real plane of numbers, on the real line, it is not actually crossing the x-axis. It is crossing an axis, and that is what we call the imaginary axis. 
So when people came up with this definition, they basically said, what would we call these numbers along this imaginary plane? We cannot just call them uh, minus 1 in this case, because we know what well, minus 1 could be x or y, but that's a real number. That's not something that fits our definition. So they had to invent another concept, and that's where the little letter i comes in. They said, well, let's, let's define i as an imaginary number, and it is not going to have a fixed value, but it is rather going to be attached to one of these numbers along this imaginary line, and it is going to basically say that's an imaginary uh, number. So by definition, the imaginary unit is equal to minus 1. So if we square it, it's equal to minus 1. So that's one of the really nice properties that it has. And this is the same as saying that it is the square root of minus 1. And you can do so all sorts of algebraic manipulation with it. You can, you can apply another power. Let's say you have i to the power of 3. What is this going to be like? Well, this is going to be i squared times i. And we know i squared is equal to minus 1. So that's going to be minus 1 times the value of i, which is the square root of minus 1. So this is going to be minus the mi square root of one, minus 1. And similarly, if you have um, i to the power of 4, that's going to be i squared times i squared and we know both of those are basically minus 1 so that's going to be minus 1 times minus 1 which is plus 1 so that's a very interesting definition if you have i to the power 4 you have plus 1 again and this sequence keeps repeating and repeating so by knowing these base numbers you can essentially calculate the value of a number to the power of n just by using that definition so now that we have actually invented a new kind of numbers, we're going to call them the complex numbers. So a complex number is going to have both a real part and an imaginary part. So just to illustrate what this looks like, let's have a complex number, and now we're going to use the um, we're going to use the notation z to mean a complex number. So a complex number has two parts. It has a real part, which is any number that pertains to real numbers. And you're going to have an imaginary part, which is going to be a number b, which is a real number, attached to this imaginary unit that we have just defined here. So a complex number may look like this. It would actually be something like 1 plus 2i. So the, in the interesting thing about this is that you can never add these two together because obviously this is a real number, this whole thing is a complex or an imaginary number, so you cannot really add them together. But you can consider this as the components of a vector in two dimensions because essentially this is a real part and this is an imaginary part and they are going to be on axes that are perpendicular to each other. So if I draw a real line on this side and I draw an imaginary line that is perpendicular to that one, then we can say that, well, let's plot the point 1 on the real line, because that's the real part of the complex number, and let's plot the imaginary part of that on the imaginary axis, and we're going to say that is 2. So now that you have those two things, the complex number is actually going to be a point on that line. But we don't usually denote it as a single point. With complex numbers, we usually denote them as a pole or a straight line going from the origin 0 0 to that point there it is not a vector by definition because it is not pointing in a specific direction it is simply a line segment from the origin of the plane to that point there defined as 1 2 i so that's the by definition what a complex number is and the reason we use this notion of a pole is because there is an angle that this is going to sustain with the real axis, and we call that angle theta. So now there's an interesting thing that comes into play, and it is we can usually define a complex number in terms of its argument or modulus, or more characteristically, in terms of its magnitude and its angle. So what is the magnitude? Well, the magnitude is denoted as two bars on the sides, or it is sometimes denoted as double bars. So this is the same as square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. And now the i has basically com come out of the equation because we're only considering the value, the value of the imaginary part. So if you treat it, if you consider a vector like vector 1 times i, and that's the unit vector in the i direction plus 2j, then 
to find the magnitude of that vector you would essentially have the square root of those two parts so you would have one squared plus two squared the same concept applies here if you consider this to be a vector now you're going to have these two components squared and added together so that's going to give you the magnitude of that now the other thing that we can infer from this is what do you think is going to be the angle defined as because the angle is just going to be the inverse of tan because we have a certain rise in the imaginary axis and we have a certain run on the real axis so that's going to be a rise of run and rise in this case is the imaginary part which is b and the run is a but usually for complex numbers we we define them within the following boundaries so the angle theta usually has um, the following definition we define it from minus pi to pi so it doesn't technically grow, go from 0 to 2 pi as you would have a normal um, angle that goes like that but rather it is either going in this direction or it is going in this direction and that's just mathematical formalism behind it and, and we'll see that it becomes quite convenient when we define this more rigorously but essentially this is a very interesting thing because it, it tells us that we can represent a complex number using a different kind of notation and that different kind of notation is going to be the following so a complex number set that has uh, components a plus or minus i b is going to be equal to its own magnitude times some function e which is the exponential or the Euler number to the power of i which is the complex identity or the complex um, unit times the angle theta and that's a very powerful definition right there so I just want you to bear with me for now we'll look more into it in future videos but for now just know that you can represent this as that and this is how you get those values for the magnitude and the angle that it presents with the real axis and you will sometimes see if you're if you're doing complex numbers in high school you might see the following notation used instead cis of theta and cis is not technically a trigonometric function as you would expect it it is simply just another another way of writing this exponential function now personally I don't like to use this definition because in most mathematical textbooks especially those that you come across after you um, start studying at university you will never see this function happening because it is not recognized as, as an actual mathematical function we prefer to use the exponential because let's face it this is a lot easier to deal with because if you were to divide two complex numbers let's say set 1 over set 2 guess what if you divide two exponentials you simply subtract their respective powers so that's a, an operation that is a lot easier to do with this even though this function still has that property we prefer to use this notation so hopefully that gives you an idea of what a complex number is but now I'm just going to plot a few examples on the argand diagram by the way this plane where you have an imaginary axis and a real axis is called the argand diagram so, so that's just the name that they give this and the set of complex numbers is usually denoted by the letter the capital letter C or you might see it as a bold letter C in some textbooks but it is essentially just the set of all complex numbers and in some sense you can consider real numbers as a subclass of complex numbers because a real number will essentially have imaginary particle to zero so complex numbers encompass uh, what real numbers are so complex numbers are a much bigger class of numbers in the whole uh, spectrum of number theory so if this is your set of real numbers this would be your set of complex numbers and after that there, there's some things that that can come into it but this is in all practicality and in all sense of the definition of numbers this is as rigorous and as general as you can get so hopefully you understand what these definitions are so just to give you a few more examples I'm just going to plot a few more complex numbers on the argon diagram so let's get rid of this let's say we have the complex number 3 minus 4i 
So let's plot that here. We have a real axis, we have our imaginary axis, so this is going to be three units in the real axis. This is going to be minus four in the imaginary axis, and then that means our complex number is going to be right here. So we draw a straight line from there to there, and that's going to represent our complex number. Now, how do we calculate the angle? Well, the angle is now going to go in that way, so we're going to define it as angle is going to be inverse tan of b over a, so this is going to be 4 over 3, we're going to ignore the minus sign for now, and what is this going to be? Well, we, we don't have a definition for it, but that's essentially what your angle is going to be, and we know that it's going to go in this direction, so in the end we should just make it negative on the outside, so that's where that negative went, it went to the outside of that. And then for our magnitude of the complex number, we're going to have the square root of 3 squared plus minus 4 squared, so this comes to 9 plus 16, which is equal to the square root of 25, and that's equal to 5. So if we wanted to express this as um, in that exponential form, which is, uh, by the way, is called the polar form, we would write 5 e to the power of i, whatever approximation we come up with this. So that's going to be minus uh, inverse 10 of 4 on 3. So that's going to be the polar form of the complex number. And the next video, we're going to see how to perform some other, uh, some other operations, uh, algebraic operations on complex numbers using this definition. So that's what we will cover in the next video.